From the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 12 through 10 through 12, reads as follows. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers, over the presence of darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Today we are beginning, uh, we are on the cusp, as we would say, of celebrating or acknowledging Memorial Day. I don't know how you could celebrate Memorial Day without stopping and first giving thanks to those that have given their lives. You know, as we think about this, is, uh, you know, we live in a very free country, if you, really, if you really stop and think about this. A very free country, one of the freest countries there is in the entire world. And that is because of those that have given their lives. So it is right that we, as a body of believers of Christ, should acknowledge the sacrifice of those that have given their life in defense of our, our freedom. Not just our country, but our freedom. But you know, I want you to, I want to kind of take a little different spin on this this morning. In the sense that I want us to think about that, that everyone in this room, I would hope, or maybe not, but can be, is a soldier, as the Bible says, in the army of God. Most of us, or many of us are retired from whatever branch of service. 21 years in the army. And when I retired, I remember what I said about U.S. Army. You know what it says? Uncle Sam ain't released me yet. But 10 years later, it did happen. You know. But we're now soldiers. Those of us that profess to have faith in Christ. In the army of God, are we not? Amen. Doesn't make a difference if you served in the military or not. You are in the army of God today. But there is a battle that is ongoing as we read in the, in the passage today. That there is a spiritual warfare. But yet, but yet the church acknowledges it. But what does it really do? Does it really understand the sacrifices that are made? You know, if you're a Christian, as I said, we are part of this army, the Lord's army, as we say. And our text shows very clearly that we're not fighting against a physical, a physical war, but a spiritual war. A spiritual war. So as we read in our text, again, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So this morning I want to ask you a very simple question. Right, okay. A very simple question. Does our church, does TFBC have battle casualties? Does TFBC have battle casualties? Now, don't think about the war, uh, such the physical war. We're talking about spiritual war. Does TFBC have battle casualties? And the answer to that is yes. But yet, church, we are guilty, myself included, of overlooking that. That we do have casualties. There's a story that goes way back about how two individual little girls changed the course of history in their particular area. Their name was Rebecca and Abigail Bates, and they lived on the coast of Massachusetts in a little, near a little village. Their father was the keeper of the lighthouse that was there, which stood at the entrance of the harbor and warning ships away from the rocky coast. Well, one day, Rebecca and Abigail were up in the tower polishing, polishing the great glass that sent this light out over the seas. And their father and mother had rowed back across from the island to the village, leaving the lighthouse in their daughter's care. Well, as they polished and have the little girls play and they do all these different things, with all of their might, they noticed something very strange. 
they noticed a strange ship that was creeping around the point. It stopped and it lowered two little boats. Two little boats which turned towards the shore. Now at that time, people feared every ship that they did not know. For the year was 1814. And America and England were at war. British ships had often sailed into this harbor, right into the harbor, and sent their soldiers ashore to attack the villages. The British had already made one raid on this particular town and had burned all the vessels that were there and then put him back to sea. Now little Rebecca and Abigail stood, on, stood frozen in this lighthouse, peering down and holding their breath while they waited to see where these two strange little boats would do or where they would go. Closer and closer they crept until finally they entered the harbor. And as they looked into the boats, they saw that they were full of British soldiers. The girls looked around the shore. There was no help to be seen. What could they do? If they could only warn the townspeople. They could only warn the townspeople. But they had no boat. There was no phones. Nothing. There would not be time to run to the village or to row to the village. There wouldn't be. So Rebecca grabbed her sister by the sleeve and said, Listen, Abigail. Here's what we two girls are going to do. And she began to whisper as if the British might hear her plan as the British continued to row closer and closer. Well, the sisters ran down, ran down the winding staircase in the lighthouse and across the lawn to their house. Abigail snatched up a drum which her father had brought home to mend. And Rebecca grabbed a fife. And she slipped out of the house. They both slipped out of the house towards the beach, crouching behind some bushes and sand hills to keep out of sight of the British. The boats now were quite close, so close that she could see. She could see the emblems on the uniform. And then all of a sudden, The boats were beginning. The men were preparing to leap out of those boats. But suddenly there was an order given to halt, to stop. And all the soldiers listened very closely. And from behind a clump of cedar trees came a beating of a drum and the squeal of that fife. It was not very skillful. But it was loud and it was very clear. You could hear the strains of Yankee Doodle floating across the sand. The English responded and they said, The militia has seen us coming, cried the British, cried the British shoulders, soldiers. They, they'll attack us soon, as soon as we land. So they turned their boats around. And they rowed back to their ship. A moment later, or moments later, a villager spotted the British boats. They raised the great alarm. And they hurried to the lighthouse. When they reached that point, they found Rebecca and Abigail Bates sitting on a rock, watching the faraway ship being put to sea. A drum and a fife lay beside them. The American army of two won that battle that day. They were decisive. What I'd like to share with you is that, yes, there are four types. Four types of casualties God's army is experiencing right now. Right now. Four types of casualties. Well, the first one is this. Killed in action. 
KIA, as we say. Luke writes as follows. It says, One day Jesus told this story to a large crowd that had gathered from, from many towns to hear him. Farmers went out to plant seeds. And as they scattered it across his field, some seeds fell on a footpath where it was stepped on. And the birds came and they ate it. Others' seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. This seed began to grow, but it soon withered away and died for the lack of moisture. Other seeds fell among the thorns that shot up and were choked out later. The tender blades were. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil. These seeds grew and produced a crop 100 times as much as he had planted. And when he had said, he called out, Anyone who is willing to hear should listen and understand. And the disciples asked him what the story meant. And he replied, You have been permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God. But I'm using these stories to conceal everything about it from the outside. So that scriptures might be fulfilled. They see what I do, but they don't really see. They hear what I say, but they don't really understand. This is the meaning of the story. The seed is God's message. The seed fell, fell on hard paths, representing those who hear the message, but then the devil comes in and steals it away and prevents them from believing and being saved. The rocky soil represents those who hear the message with joy, but like the young plants in such soil, their roots don't go very deep. They believe for a while, but they wilter when the hot winds of testing blows. The thorny ground represents those who hear and accept the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life. So they never grow into maturity. But the good soil, the good soil represents good-hearted people who hear God's message, cling to it, and steadily produce a huge harvest. It's an honorable thing, as I said this morning, that we remember the sacrifices of our nation's great veterans who gave their lives on the battlefield abroad and even here. Well, by some, by some estimates, there are 1.3 million Americans who have shed their blood and died for freedom, for the freedom's cause. And still, the magnitude, as this number is, is pale, is pale in comparison to the men, number of men and women and children who have given their life, who have given their life in freedom, for freedom's eternal causes. Michael J. McLaredom writes for the Journal of American Academy of Religion. He wrote, in the 2002 edition, he says this, the total number of Christian martyrs during the 20th century is reported to be at 45 million. He finished his thought by defining Christian, mart Christian martyrs as believers in Christ who lost their lives prematurely in a situation of witnessing as a result of human hostility. You know, God only knows how many more have shed their blood for the cause of Christ in the last 2,000 plus years. It's fitting this morning we likewise remember their sacrifice, but still more fitting, more fitting to remember the one they believed in who shed the purity of his blood for freedom's cause. For without the sacrifice or our risen Lord, we in America would not enjoy the freedom we love and know so well. They all, were, all promised allegiance to the great commander, the Lord Jesus Christ. His commission and his kingdom they were taught, three, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him shall have what? Eternal life. Have eternal life. And as they went out 
in the Great Commission, as we say. They witnessed, they shared their faith. And they went out against a well-armed army. The army of the world. The powers of this world. A well-trained enemy who literally just zapped them all at once. Their faith utterly, was utterly destroyed. They were utterly destroyed. We mourn their loss. The second one is this. Those that are missing in action. MIA, as we say. Or in this case, presumed to be dead. James says this in James 1. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the message God has planted in your heart. For it is strong enough to save your souls. And remember, it is the message to obey and not just to listen. If you don't obey, you are not only fooling yourself. For if you listen and don't obey, it is like looking at your face in the mirror, but doing nothing to improve your appearance. You see yourself. You walk away and forget what you look like. But if you keep looking steadily into God's perfect law, the law that sets you free, and you will do what it says, and don't forget what you hear, then God will bless you for doing it. In the southern part of the United States, there, are many, uh, there were, quote, many memorials Many, many memorials in many, many of the towns where many of the bloodiest campaigns were fought during, on American soil during the Civil War. Over 60,000 died in that particular conflict. What is often not known that both North and South allowed what they call substitute soldiers. Substitute soldiers. A man that was drafted for military service could literally buy another man to go to war in his place. This lasted until 1863, when there were no more available men, and began about the same time in the North, where immigrants were often paid to fight in someone else's places. This is where the term we get, rich man's war, poor man's fight, became very popular. Can you imagine paying someone to fight in your place. Most to die in your place. How humbling that might have been. Yet today, all of us gather for worship on this Memorial Day weekend. Humbly gathering. Knowing that not only did soldiers die for our freedom as a nation. But that we have a substitute that died for our place on that cross for eternal freedom. You see, we still carry many of those MIA, those presumed dead, in, on the roll, or of what we call sometimes in the military, duty rosters. But only a few, but only a few of those people will show up when there's a muster. Show up when there's a muster. Maybe they'll show up at Christmas. Maybe they'll show up at Easter. Maybe they'll show up at Mother's Day or any of the holidays. They will muster. They will show up. If there is any spiritual life in them, it is so little that no equipment with which the church can supply can detect it. We mourn their loss also too. The third casualty we might is this. Missing in action also too. But we believe they are prisoners. Prisoners. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 tells us this. For it is impossible to restore to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and share in the, Holy, in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the power of the age to come, and who in turn away from, who turned away from God. It is impossible to bring such people to repentance again because they are 
nailing the Son of God to the cross again by rejecting him, holding him up in public shame. Missing of action will lead prisoners. During the American Civil Revolu American Revolution, farmers who joined the Confederate Army during the springtime and summertime, they went AWOL, absent without leave, in the fall and in the winter. They were known as what is called summer soldiers. They signed up with the army after their crops were planted. They fought the British over the summer, and then they returned home to help with the harvest. Meanwhile, citizens who supported the revolutions when the war effort was going on, well, were called what they call sunshine patriots. I think we could use that term Patriots take that word patriots out and use sunshine Christians when things are all going well. This led Thomas Paine to write his famous pamphlet, Common Sense, in which he, started, he, he stated, There are times that try men's soul, summer soldiers and sunshine patriots will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country, but he now stands, deserves the love and thanks of the men and women. The army of God needs soldiers who will not shrink away from battle, who will not shrink away from their duties. Men and women who are willing to commit to serving the commander of their salvation, the Lord God. Are we, as what we would say, fair weather Christians or sunshine Christians? You see, this, this category is represented by those who are seen in the enemy's, enemy's side of the lines, not ours. We believe that they are prisoners. They literally identify, identify with the enemy. They may have deserted or Captured when rendered helpless. But the results are the same. They lay down their arms. They lay down their arms and cease to fight. It makes no difference about the oath of loyalty or conviction now. They cannot help anyone anymore. And so as far as the battle that we are fighting in the spiritual warfare... The battle is concerned. They're literally dead. But we mourn their loss. The final one is this. Missing in action. 2 Timothy 4.10 says this. Demetrius has, has deserted me because he loves the things of life and has gone to Thessalonica. Cessians has gone to Galilee. And Titus has gone to Damalia. We don't know. We don't know. What became of them? We just don't. But they're still on the roster, or what we call the roles. No one has seen them for a long time. Can you think of a few people that you know that were attending, but you haven't seen them in a while? Yeah. There's been no report from them. No report at all. No one at all has seen them. They're on the roster, but they don't show. Paul is very clear when he says this. He says that we are in a battle, in a spiritual warfare battle. And those of us that have been in battle know what it feels like to be there. We know that there are many thoughts. But we know one thing else. That the person that is on my left or on my right is there. The term that we use is, I've got your back. So when we face that enemy together, are we facing them individually or are we facing them as an army? A consolidated one body 
in Christ. We call ourselves one body. We call ourselves the body of Christ, which the Bible is so true. We are many parts in that Bible, in the body. All of us have different roles. The hand cannot do what the ear's job is, or the eye cannot do what the foot's job is. Each of us have roles in this battle, in this army, in God's army. Each of us have roles in this church. But my question is to you is this. Which one of these casualties, which one are you? If you are on the front line and you're serving God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and all of your desire to be pleasing to Him, then God bless you and I pray for you and continue to give you the strength. But if you're in that back line sitting there and let somebody else do it, then I pray that God and the Holy Spirit moves you to the position of where becoming involved in the church. This summer is a great opportunity to be involved with the VBS. Well, I can't do nothing. I can't chase these kids. No, but you sure can stand there and you sure can help the other adults that are teaching. You sure can help the young people that are there. You sure can help and be the present because the children will see what you do, what I do. They will learn that. Oh, they'll learn Bible verses, but they will learn more by your and my actions of what we do. The old saying that we say many, many times, do you walk the talk? Do you? Do you walk that talk? Do you? Paul is clear that this is a battle that is ongoing. And there are casualties that happen all the time. And when there are wounded, that we as a brother and as, a, as the body of Christ need to go in and do the healing and help them come back into full, full fold. But do we do that? Do we? I pray that we do. And I pray in the next few weeks and months that we do so. As we begin our Stephen's ministry in the next, in the last part of this year, I hope that you will be pray for that you are praying about it, to be involved in that ministry. Because it is a healing ministry. And as we stop on this Memorial Day weekend, as we prepare for our barbecues and all of the other things we're going to do, we need to stop and to give thanks to God for the ultimate sacrifice and saving us. Some of you have not received Christ. Be very blunt. Some of you think you may have received Christ, but some of you have not. Some of you have not signed, quote, on the dotted line to say, I am enlisting, I am joining God's army. If you haven't done so, then I would encourage you today, when we do our last song, to come forward and enlist in the army of God. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you've done so already, then I would also encourage you to come forward and let me pray for you and let me announce you to joining of this. I want the praise team to come up, but there's one other thing I want you to think about this in a moment. And that is, is that we are called to be in the army of God as believers. When God saved us, he said to you and he said to me, come join me.